In business today, three things to know. First, eBay's plan to spin off PayPal. How analysts say turning PayPal into a publicly traded company could revitalize the brand. Then, Hong Kong's China syndrome. Beijing says it won't negotiate. Protesters say they won't go home. And the markets are getting jittery about a confrontation in the wings. And from the farmhouse to the White House, we'll meet one young African leader turning agriculture into a tourism business. Arise Exchange starts now. Hello everyone, I'm Andrew Schmertz. The deal at auction site eBay is for PayPal. eBay announcing Tuesday it will spin off the online payment service into a separately traded company, something activist investors have been pushing for for some time. The announcement comes as PayPal faces new competition from multiple sources, including Apple. Wall Street generally liked the announcement. Shares of eBay rose just over 7.5% today, up $3.97 to 56.63. Ari Zoldan, CEO of Quantum Networks and an expert on all things tech, joins us now. Ari, why is eBay doing this and making this decision now? So there's a couple of reasons. First, we have Carl Icahn on, on one side of it as a stock activist, really, really pushing for the split off. Um, second, I think PayPal wants their own brand identity. And I think separating the two, actually, you know, we saw the street's reaction, was actually very, very positive. I think long term also, it's going to suit both of them really well. Do you think that PayPal has suffered under eBay's Banner, PayPal, of course, was originally started by, by Peter Thiel, sure. uh, Elon Musk, um, and then it was absorbed by eBay. No, absolutely not. I think it just did just the opposite. I think it actually it helped build PayPal's brand, and also, I mean, all our customers from eBay, everybody floated right into PayPal. So I think at the beginning it was phenomenal, but I think as PayPal continued to evolve and grow, it, it started building its own identity. And I think that's part of the reason, too, why PayPal wants to separate from eBay, just to continue building their own brand. And PayPal has outperformed eBay, though, as far as sales growth has, goes, right? Right, exactly, too. So that's just another reason for PayPal's wanting to, or PayPal's board wanting to spin away from, from eBay. What do you make of this news that also PayPal was starting to have trouble attracting top quality talent to work right. there. So I've heard that. I mean, a lot of companies, it's not just PayPal, it's not just eBay. There's a lot of companies out there, especially within the tech community, that are having a hard time not only finding talent, but retaining talent. And, and that's just a constant battle, I think, with the industry, not just specific with eBay and PayPal. I take it when eBay spins this off, eBay is going to be looking at a pretty decent return on its investment. I think so. I think so. I mean, they're, they're not going to be starving. That's that's for sure. And I think what's most important is that the customers are not going to suffer because of the the part. I'm calling it. A, it's a very very friendly divorce, mm -hmm. and it's a divorce that both parties are going to be working together in the future. Uh, they're also doing this, I imagine, because PayPal is facing a, a slew of new competition. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, look, all, all these new mobile providers are coming out right now. They're all getting into the mobile payments. So there's going to be a lot, a lot of uh, competition out there, especially with with Apple's new program coming out, rolling out with Pay Two. So PayPal's going to have, um, I think that they're still going to be the dominant player in the marketplace, but they're going to have a lot of competition out there as well, and they're going to have to keep evolving and and uh, and reinventing themselves. Has PayPal done a good job? Because Apple says it's getting these high-end retailers to join its system. I've always, and, and this may simply be a bias against PayPal, but I've always seen PayPal as sort of a lower-end player here. Am I wrong? No, it is. It's pretty much the everyday, you know, everybody, it's it's become common, common language where I can, you know, Andrew, I'll, I'll PayPal you $5 after the show. So, um, you know, is it gonna eventually going to become, you know, a, a higher level brand where corporations will start, you know, PayPaling? Probably not, and I think you're right. I think possibly PayPal, uh, Apple's pay program will probably get that demographic. Okay, now there's going to be some new people leading both of these companies, I understand. Right. Right, so we have, we have former CEOs, former founders. There's going to be a lot of shifting back and forth, um, but I think overall, I think the the spinoff is actually really good, not only for Wall Street but for the investors as well. And what do you see as far as consumers go? Are there going to be any changes to how PayPal is going to operate in this space? I don't think so. At the end of the day, the end user is not going to notice one iota of a difference. Yeah, and and this is a case I think where you know we often see divorces among companies to quote unlock value because something is being held back. I don't know if that's the case here, right? This is this is two companies 
companies performing decently. eBay's having some problems. Right. PayPal doing pretty well. 100%. So, so the divorce is going to be friendly. They're actually going to, they're going to work better, I think, separately than they are together. And they have all the children, which is all their, all right. which yeah. is all their, all their customers. So um, I think it's going to work out really well. Okay. Ari Zoltan, thank you so much. My pleasure, Andrew. Okay. Turning to the markets, shares dipped Tuesday as the third quarter came to a close. Let's take a look at the final numbers. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closing down. Hello. <laughs> I don't have the numbers, I don't think. The Dow closing down. The S&P 500, there you go. Thank you. The Dow closing down 28 points off its lows. The S&P 500 pulling back as well. And the NASDAQ finishing in the red. Taking a look at our top stocks. Walgreens reporting a loss in its fourth quarter, largely attributed to its $866 million charge to purchase European beauty retailer Alliance Boots. Walgreens down 33 cents. Remember the gravity-defying movie Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon? Well, a sequel is coming, but it reportedly won't be widely released in the theaters. It will first be available on Netflix and a limited showing of IMAX screens. Netflix closing up a buck 62. And News Corp is purchasing the online site Move, which owns real estate websites, for $950 million. News Corp says the deal will expand its digital marketing business. News Corp up 14 cents. Taking a look at commodities, gold pulling back, and oil. Look at that sell-off today, down better than 3% to 91.54. Consumer confidence slumped in August. The conference board says its index fell for the first time in four months. And home prices in 20 cities across the country slowed in July. The S&P Case-Shiller Home Index showed prices fell 0.5% against expectations for growth. Tony Dwyer is U.S. Portfolio Strategist at Conaccord Genuity and joins us now. Tony, thank you. Welcome back to Arise Exchange. Great to see you, Andrew. Uh, there is so much to talk about today. Uh, it is one of the first shows we've led in a while that we haven't really talked about all of the trouble overseas. You're a little bit concerned, though, that there are some, quote, scary times out there. Well, it's a perception that there's scary times. We feel like this is such a unique environment, but truly, we're almost exactly like we were in 1996. You were up over 100% from the low. You had actually, if you, back in 1996 in the summertime, bin Laden issued his initial jihad against uh, America in the West. Russia was battling the Chechen rebels, and Israel was attacking Hezbollah. So it, it's Nothing's really, <laughs> it's not that different. You also had a very slow global growth environment. It was the precursor to the Asian economic crisis. The U.S. dollar was rallying. Europe was very slow as Eastern Europe was being absorbed into Western Europe. So it's not, it's not a dissimilar time. And at the same time, the U.S. accelerated because after the credit crisis of the savings and loan crisis in the early 1990s, banks started lending. Mm -hmm. There was demand for loans. So even though you had this slow global growth environment, you had an acceleration in the service-based economy in the United States, and it appears that, that we're kind of rhyming very closely with that environment. But banks aren't lending like they lend back then, are they? Or are they they're beginning to? to. They're starting so to. So that's positive. The idea that, that we've got to go back to where we were mm -hmm. in the last cycle is insane. Why would you ever want to lend to people that you know will not pay you back unless you mark up their mortgages so they can take out equity that isn't there? And we are Le starting to see that a little bit, right? They're starting to rewrite the rules a little bit because they're getting nervous about the lack of lending. Well, the lack of lend, correct, except it's, it's progressing like you want it to progress. It's mm. slow. slow. It's methodical. Um, the only issue that I see that could be dangerous down the road is some of the shadow banking, the non-regulated lending, where you have hedge funds, private equity firms, or even Internet companies mm. that are funded lending outside and of the and purview we really of the don't, Fed. And we really don't know how big that market potentially is. Correct. It's, it's quite big. Okay. So... Um, so the market has been going such a pace upwards. Basically, what you're saying is it, it could be something that spooks it because giving people a reason to kind of take some money off the table. It's being spooked. Yeah. Like if you reading your story, going through the stories as you're coming in, the market has been spooked. Mm -hmm. There's now uh, um, less than 50 percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average. The market, the individual stocks have already been under pressure. I think this great idea that the market's telling us something, yeah, it's telling us it's probably a good time to be a buyer. You have low inflation, an easy Fed, a steep yield curve, meaning lending is, is picking up, positive economic activity, and positive earnings direction. That hasn't changed in four years. So why is it going to change today because you're up 8% or 7%? You have oil down. It, it yeah, seems me, so let me, negative. Let me, let me ask you about oil. In the past, when we've had all of these international issues go on, oil has spiked. Has that changed because the U.S. is producing more oil, or is the global political environment just different that we're now getting a sell-off in oil? I think it's a combination of, well, 
think of those things I just gave you in 1996, right? Mm -hmm. when, did oil, when did gasoline hit a dollar a gallon? 1998, 1999. So yes, you can have commodities go down due to slower global demand, which benefits, again, the U.S. consumer who's beginning to get credit. And we have to remember that oil is a tax on consumers. So why are we getting these two different numbers on consumer confidence? We're sort of getting mixed news. Consumer sentiment was improved. Consumer confidence down a little bit. Is it just numbers? It's just numbers. <laughs> uh, you know, if I, if I could ever suggest one thing for all the viewers, yeah. don't pay attention to individual numbers. Look at the trend of the numbers. Yeah, we, and the we, trend of the numbers is confidence has been getting better this entire yeah, cycle. Yeah, and we always say that. And I always kind of accuse all of us, me included, that business reporters are like sports reporters. Like if the Giants win this week, they're going to the Super Bowl. They right. lose next week. It's going to be a horrible season. Well, well let's talk and, about oil for a second, right? Mm -hmm. Down 3%, down $3. It's, you know, everybody run for the hill, light your hair on fire, <laughs> except for me. Right. Right? It's right back to where it's been already over the last few weeks. It had a bounce, and now it's back to down where it, So mm -hmm. it's not like there's a collapse and oil prices, there's weakness in oil prices than there should be. The dollar is strong and, the, and overseas is weakening. And a strengthening dollar good overall for the U.S. economy right now? As long as, the, as, long as credit is being made available, it, will, it should draw assets into the U.S. I mean, if you think of the valuation expansion, everybody remembers the late 1990s as the glory days of, yeah. of the U.S. economy and stock market. It was associated with a very strong dollar. Mm -hmm. The reality is... It's a stable currency because you have a stable government, even though it seems not so stable. <laughs> well, when you compare it to all the others, right? Uh, it's a flight to quality. The dollar always, always a flight to quality. Tony Correct. Blair, thank you so much. Thanks, Andrew. Coming up, China's warning to Hong Kong. You're watching Arise Exchange. Last week on a rise of change. climate change made its way to the top of the agenda at the United Nations General Assembly, even as the world debates how to handle ISIS, Ukraine, and Ebola. We're going to have some business leaders, we're going to have some global leaders that are going to say, these are the actions we're going to take. The marijuana business owner slash TV reporter quit on the air so she can go full time into her pot business. Spreading the message of freedom. And I'm going to start with Matt Watch this week for more Arise Exchange. News can definitely be improved when reflecting diversity. A lot of mainstream news, they, they don't dive into it. Who wants to hear about negativity all the time? They only show what you what they think people want to know and not what people really should know. World based stories. That's what I enjoy the most. I think uh, diversity of news is important to the world so that everybody will be aware of their surroundings and what is happening today. Arise News, every culture, every angle. There's certain news programs that have a Democrat and a Republican and all they do is, here's the Democrat saying his side and the Republicans say, you know, it's a little debate show, but not everybody is a sort of an extremist on one side or the other. People are in the middle a lot more. Arise News, every culture, every angle. Welcome back to Arise Exchange. It's Wednesday morning in Hong Kong, and there are a few signs that the protesters are going away. Hong Kong's chief executive says Beijing will not back down from its demands that the Chinese government pre-approve candidates for upcoming city elections. Protesters say that is going back on Beijing's word to have free elections. The chief executive says Beijing will not negotiate. The central government won't be swayed by illegal activities. This illegal protest will not force the central government to go back on its decision of August 31st. Protesters have threatened to expand their demonstrations and begin occupying government buildings. Neil Batia is with the Century Foundation in New York to explain the conflict and the business impact on the rest of the world. Neil, welcome to Arise Exchange, and thank you for coming by. Happy to be here. All right, so paint the picture of what's going on in Hong Kong right now. So what we're looking at is basically unprecedented protest against the Chinese Communist Party leadership in Beijing trying to impose their will on Hong Kong. If we remember in 1997, when the British handed over Hong Kong to the Chinese, there was a promise there that eventually Hong Kongers would be able to choose their own leadership. And now it looks like the Chinese are trying to renege on that promise. How realistic was this idea of one country, two systems? It was never really realistic, and I think we're now seeing how great the tension is between a China that has an open market but does not have an open political system. Um, have the Chinese, do you think, shown restraint here? And, and from your sense, in the government of China, how worried are they about, let's say, a repeat of Tiananmen Square? 
Uh, I don't think there's a worry that this will be another Tiananmen because they control the use of force. I think what they're trying to calculate is how widespread are the protests supported among all Hong Kongers. If you look at polling that looked at the question whether these people should be able to choose from either a slate approved from Beijing or an open slate of candidates, about 50 percent wanted an open slate, about 35 to 40 percent were willing to take the five or so options that Beijing offered, and the rest were unsure. So the Chinese may be calculating at this point that if they can wait out the protests, the support for it may dwindle to the point where it's no longer a threat. And what is your sense of the business leadership in China and Hong Kong? Because the big businessmen, for the most part, have pretty close ties to Beijing, don't they, in order to function? Absolutely. I mean, political connections are everything in China. I would guess at this point that they're communicating their concern, but it's very muted. Uh, the Chinese, among every other factor, pro are interested in social harmony and keeping the Chinese people from demanding even more democratic voice. And that, for the time being, may take precedence over losing money in the short term. And the economy, though, ultimately will drive this in China, right? They are pretty sensitive to possibly economic pressure? Absolutely, especially external pressure if they see over the course of this crisis, capital flight, for example, people pulling money out of the Hang Seng. It was down today, I believe. We're seeing a sell-off. Yeah. Um, that may, over time, uh, infect their decision-making, indeed. You know, last week, and, and I talked about this yesterday, last week China looked great with the uh, IPO of Alibaba. And you had Jack Ma on 60 Minutes kind of dodging the questions about political influence. And then this kind of just blew up overnight. Uh, it, it, it's sort of a black eye for China right now, isn't it? Uh, it definitely is. It's embarrassing for the leadership. Uh, it's embarrassing that this kind of reaction to something that they thought they had managed pretty well um, but again, you're seeing basically the central contradiction in modern China is that we can have people buy and sell things freely, but they can't voice their concerns or really influence their leadership directly. And things have been going okay so far with that. But whether this is the sign of something to come is an open question. Do you think the Chinese miscalculated here, or are they worried that if they give Hong Kong the free vote, it becomes something that might spread to mainland, plus they have a tougher sell with Taiwan, for example, which is clearly looking at the situation. Right. They're clearly um, sympathetic, obviously, to what Hong Kongers are going through. I think the Chinese felt that this sort of middle option would be palatable to, I would say, the silent majority of Hong Kongers who don't protest, who don't want an expansion beyond the rights that they've been afforded so far. Uh, that appears to have been uh, a problem in the short term, and I think the Chinese are waiting to see if it grows beyond where it is now. Okay, I want to change gears for a moment. You're also an expert on India. The uh, Indian Prime Minister was at the White House today. What happened? So they had their uh, first joint meeting with President Obama that went, by all uh, indications, very well. They published a joint op-ed in the Washington Post, which is unprecedented for an Indian Prime Minister and a U.S. president to do. And I think the general tenor of the conversation is that Modi was able to introduce himself to the American people, to American business leaders, and American politicians as a reasonable guy. And we sell a tremendous amount of arms to India. Absolutely. They are a major customer. Um, U.S. defense manufacturers, among the things that they wanted to see from a new Modi government, was a lift on the cap in foreign direct investment. And the Indians so far have been amenable to that as long as there's sort of a um, carve out for joint technological cooperation. Okay. Neil, thank you so much for coming by and explaining this to us. Thank you so much. Okay. Time now for our business ticker stories making headlines across the nation and the world. This is breaking news. The CDC has confirmed the first case of Ebola in the United States. A patient at Texas Health Presbyterian Dallas Hospital tested positive for the disease and is being held in strict isolation as doctors evaluate his level of exposure. The patient was admitted to the hospital based on symptoms and his or her recent travel history. We will continue to update the story and have more on Arise America throughout the evening. The European Union says Apple's tax deal with Ireland is rotten. They say Ireland is helping the world's most valuable company avoid paying billions in taxes in return for jobs. The European Commission says Ireland's cozy deals with Apple amount to illegal state aid. Spokesman for the Irish government says EU policies are being followed and Apple says it has received no special treatment. 
Walmart appears to be blaming the victim, in this case, comedian Tracy Morgan, following an accident that left one person dead. Walmart, responding to a Morgan lawsuit, says his injuries were the result of him not wearing a seatbelt. Morgan sued Walmart after he and two other comedians were severely injured and another passenger killed in a collision with a Walmart truck. The driver of the Walmart truck had allegedly fallen asleep after being awake over 24 hours. Shocking numbers from the World Wildlife Fund. According to the WWF, the world has lost half of its wildlife population in the past four decades. The report breaks down the shrinking populations by environment, with 76% of freshwater fish disappearing since 1970. Interestingly, high-income countries actually saw a 10% growth in wildlife. And the Fed may think it has inflation under control, but burger lovers know better. A new index measures the value of the dollar, not against solid gold, but cheesy gold layered over bacon and thick beef patties. We're talking about the bacon cheeseburger here. Analysts at the brokerage firm Convergex use the bacon cheeseburger index to gauge consumer price pressures. And according to the firm, the price of eating a staple of the fast food industry is up 5.8%, along with your waistline. Ahead, how not to drive in the carpool lane. Our favorite person of the day is next here on Arise Exchange. Arise News is a different kind of network. We are able to tell our own stories, and we're able to cover stories in a way that other media outlets don't do. We've got world-class journalists, veteran journalists who have been in this industry for decades, not just in front of the camera, but behind the scenes as well. Arise News is a place where we can tell stories in an interesting, factual, inclusive way like no one else in the business can. Because we live in a global, interconnected world, business news no longer stops when the markets close on Wall Street. And what we've discovered over the past few years of the financial crisis is that events and news that happen even in the smallest countries impact the United States and the world at large. As we bring together experts and analysts and thought leaders and CEOs and companies across many industries to not only provide the macroeconomic view, but news everyday people can use. We have this very important follow-up to Monday's Our Favorite Person of the Day. You'll recall we reported that author Lena Dunham had planned on using a warm-up act as part of her 11-day tour for her new book, Not That Kind of Girl. Dunham, the creator of the HBO series Girls, immediately took heat because she had planned on paying the artists and actors nothing, despite earning a $3.7 million advance on the book. Well, Dunham has seen an onslaught of bad press and has changed her mind. She tweeted, quote, there were some good points raised, and I've ensured that all the opening acts will, in fact, be compensated. Don't know if they'll be above minimum wage or a living wage, but she says they will be compensated. And that takes us to today's favorite person of the day, when we pick one person who grabbed our attention and not for the right reasons. Today, it is a Washington State woman who thought she could drive in the HOV lane with a giant stuffed bear riding shotgun. The 19-year-old woman, there is the bear, was pulled over by a state trooper and then get this, racked up $818 in tickets. Besides illegally using the carpool lane with a stuffed bear, she was speeding and did not even have insurance. So for being barely creative in her use of the HOV lane, the unnamed driver is our favorite person of the day. Bear on board, I love it. Next, we'll meet one of Africa's young leaders and how he's turning a centuries-old business into modern-day tourism. You're watching Arise Exchange. Informative, the U.S. economy is on the right path and the wizard of the Fed is leading the way. We started our companies originally to create something that made a positive difference. Compelling. I became very successful. Not allowing myself to be average. Our favorite person of the day when we pick one person who grabbed our attention and not for the right reason. Yeah, he sort of lost All it. business. Investors came back from the long weekend tanned, rested, and ready to buy stocks. Entertaining Money Daily, Arise Exchange. 
I think that people in America do care about what happens throughout the world. Global warming is probably something that has to be addressed sooner rather than later. In Somalia, the genocide there, and that's something people don't know about. They have no idea the brevity of that situation. The first thing I think about when I think of Africa is like war and famine and disease. And right now with the tsunami that happened or the earthquakes in you know, Japan, we always look out for other people. Arise News, every culture, every angle. From an African farmhouse to the White House, our next guest is on the arise. Amadou Sissoko was recently selected by President Obama to take part in the Young African Leaders Initiative. He is the CEO of Athaba, an agro-tourism company in Guinea. He's also the founder of the organization Making Africa a Continent of Innovators. Amadou joins us now from Washington, D.C. to talk about this terrific honor. Congratulations. What was it like at the White House? I was a, it was a beautiful experience. It was a life-changing experience. I could, I could imagine that. Uh, what is agro-tourism? I had not heard that phrase before. Well, agro-tourism, as, uh, as I've been able to develop it, is an integration of uh, commercial agriculture and uh, uh, touristic, uh, tourism, uh, tourism offer. Let's say to everything related to uh, being able to host a group of people, being able to show them the culture of the, the area, being able to uh, offer them uh, uh, services like uh, restoration, uh, hotel, uh, conferences, and things like that. So, so it's uh, the integration of tourism and agriculture. And it's a working farm, correct? Yes, it is. And you, you, know, you mentioned modern farming, and that has somewhat been a, a challenge throughout Africa. What kind of strides are you making in that department? Well, my, my, my vision was that uh, a farmer of today should be an entrepreneurial farmer. So it's not just farming to, to have something to eat, but you have to be able to sell your products and be able to market yourself, market your area, have people come visit your farm, uh, sell the, the story of, of the, the area where you're working so that you can be able to generate more revenue and at the same time be able to offer more choices to your family and your kids. And um, what about sustainability? Because I imagine that's an ongoing issue as well. Well, uh, if you integrate like we do, we have a, an integrated farm, whereas hmm. uh, we do organic farming. But because organic farming alone cannot be able to be uh, commercially viable in, in, in places like Africa, uh, that commercial, uh, that organic farming is offered to expats and hotels that want that high-end product. But you also have other types of farming techniques that uh, give you the opportunity to have to do permaculture or to recycle the use, for example, when, when you have uh, eggs, when you have chickens and they lay eggs and also they, they produce their manure, that can be used as a, as a fertilizer for your bananas, for example. So okay. it's integrating your activities on the farm. Tell us personally how you got started in the farming industry. What were you doing before? Well, I, 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 I got a scholarship when I finished high school to go study medicine. And uh, my father is a doctor. He wanted me to be like him. Mm -hmm. But uh, I dropped out of med school because I realized that my passion was uh, helping people become better and improve uh, themselves in different fields in, in their lives and in their professional life. So when I came back to Guinea after Czech Republic, I, uh, I started different types of businesses that failed. And then at some point, I needed myself to take a retreat. So I went to help my mom on her farm, and I saw that the farm had potential, but that there needed to be a, a larger vision. So I, I set out to help her develop herself from the activity that she was doing, but also to develop the farm and the work there. Are, so that, that's how it started. Are you seeing a lot of African entrepreneurs partnering with American business people? And what would your, the, your advice be for Americans looking to Africa? Well, I think that uh, after this U.S.-Africa summit, uh, Africa got a lot of visibility on the, the U.S. continent. But I believe that this is something that's been happening for a long time. There are Americans that have already invested in Africa. But I think for me, it's more uh, the small and medium-sized businesses that also need to be interested in the continent. But for them to have the courage to take that risk to, to go and invest in Africa, there needs to be, on one side, they need to know that those big industries that are right now uh, publicizing, that they're going there, they need to either see their success. And if those ones succeed, and they can also promote a better image of an Africa where you can have a serious businessman with whom you can interact, you have a, a, a willing government that's open to business, that can encourage uh, those who have less, less, uh, less means 
uh, but also want to be a part of this growth to be able to go on the continent. Amadou, congratulations, and it's a big honor to have you on the program today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And ahead this week on Arise Exchange, as the fall network television season kicks off, we'll look at how the spotlight continues to shift to other mediums. Let's take a quick look at the numbers once again. Red arrows across the board for the markets. I'm Andrew Schmertz. Thanks for watching Arise Exchange. See you tomorrow.